Hello there everyone, it's UXW Bill here once again with another episode of Kitchen Table Electronics Repair. And on this Kitchen Table Electronics Repair episode, what I'm going to do today is try to repair a problem with this Sherwood RX5502 AM FM4 channel stereo receiver. Now these Sherwood receivers are of great interest to me because when they're working properly, the RX4105 and the RX4109 are excellent bargains for the money. In fact, I even made a video to that effect some time ago discussing the merits of these receivers and why I recommended them. Because for a hundred United States dollars, and probably similar amounts elsewhere in the world, you can get a receiver that sounds much better than it ought to, and it also has a phono input in the case of the RX4109. However, some people do not share my rosy view of these receivers after having had them die. Now, while some of this is no doubt attributable to customer stupidity, such as hooking up speakers that don't satisfy the impedance ratings of the receiver, thusly causing the amplifier to burn out and fail, there are some problems with these receivers that have been reported. I have heard people say that the filter capacitors are subject to failure, and I have also heard of the final transistors failing. Well, I've tried to secure a broken receiver of my own so I could actually see what goes wrong in at least one example of one of these units, but the one time I tried with an RX4109, it turned out to be a case of operator error. The previous owner had simply turned the speakers off and the unit was actually fine. All of my Sherwood receivers have continued to deliver stellar service and I would persist in my recommendation of them. But a person came to Audio Karma with this receiver and they said it would not stay turned on. And indeed it does not. You can attempt to turn it on and if you do, it will go ahead and try to start up. However, after about 10 seconds or so, it will shut down with a blinking power light. Now ordinarily when a stereo receiver or any other kind of audio amplifier just shuts down unexpectedly or even blows its fuse, there's a good reason for it. Usually this means that the power amplifier, specifically the final power transistors, have taken some kind of damage. But I got to looking at this unit and I don't think that's the case here. This, as you can see, is the amplifier board out of the RX5502 receiver and it is billed as being a four-channel amplifier board. However, that's not really true. This is only a stereophonic amplifier, just like the RX4105 and 4109 series. However, this is what you would call a multi-zone stereo receiver and amplifier. That is to say that this thing is capable of and intended to be used with speakers that are distributed throughout a home, office, or some other kind of business environment. And further, not only can this thing drive a total of four sets of speakers, A, B, C, and D, it can also play a separate source to speakers connected at locations C and D. So this thing has more amplify, amplification circuitry built into it to handle that need, whether it's simply playing the same source across all speakers, or it's playing a different source across the other two sets of speakers that it supports. I went ahead and I looked over this amplifier board and I found no burns, no signs of damage, which are usually things that happen when an amplifier fails violently enough. I also tilted this board down off of the heat sink here, as you can see, so that I could desolder the legs of the transistors from the board and test them. And what I found is that each and every one of these transistors, from the main power transistors to the actual little driver transistors, they all test good. Now an ohmmeter test is not foolproof, and I certainly do not have a proper transistor checker, but the results are very encouraging and suggest that there is not a problem with this amplifier module. So I'm back to looking at other circuitry in the receiver. As you can clearly see, even with the amplifier board completely removed and disconnected, the unit still starts up, falls over, and shuts down. Now it could be that the microcontroller in this thing, which is actually a little computer, this thing is computer driven, at least as far as its user interface and adjustments go, but it could be that the computer is not seeing a condition that it wants to see satisfied and so it just shuts down again. But I don't think that's quite true because occasionally I have gotten this thing to power up and I have gotten it to stay powered up. 
which tells me there's something funny going on in the power supply. Something here is not happening like it ought to. And my attention in particular is directed at these two voltage regulators right here. These are two 7812 DC positive voltage regulators for 12 volts. They take an input voltage and they regulate it to precisely 12 volts DC with an allowable current draw of at least one amp and in some cases possibly more with heat sinking if the manufacturer of the part in question says that's allowable. Now as you can see Sherwood has chosen to use two of them in this design. There is also a third 7912 voltage regulator right next to the heat sink that is apparently significantly less loaded because it does not have a heat sink on it. It also does not get particularly warm in operation. Well, One of these 12 volt regulators is working perfectly. It's getting warm to the touch and it's doing everything it ought to. The other 12 volt regulator does not seem to be doing anything. I've taken a meter lead and I've carefully weaseled it down in here. Try and get this so you can see it here. On the first regulator, the one to the left of this picture, I have about 25 volts coming in and I have about 12 volts going out. On the second one I have the same thing but there's nothing coming out other than a couple of hundred millivolts, so something is clearly going on here with this second regulator. It's also not getting warm to the touch. Why is this relevant? Well, because there are a couple different power supplies going to the amplifier board in this thing. The first is represented in this first connector and is actually a split power supply denoted by the two B minus and the two B plus indications. Those are the main power supplies to the final transistors. Those power supplies are responsible for delivering the final level of amplification to the sound that makes it audible on your speakers. Over here at the other connector, however, there is a positive 12 volt output and you guessed it, it's very low. There's only a couple of hundred millivolts there with the power on. So I am thinking that something is either loading down this second regulator or it's actually bad. And since I can't find anything too obviously wrong between here and there, I'm inclined to think that the regulator is bad. And so I'm going to go ahead and pop it out of there and replace it with another one. Now I don't have a 7812 regulator, but I do have an LM340T rated for 12 volts, and all of those regulator parts are members of the same family. So it should be okay to stick this in there, give it a try, and see if the set comes back to life. And if it does, and if I'm done in time, I'll be able to give this thing a good long smoke test when I listen to my favorite radio program tonight. So stay tuned! Now while I'm waiting for my desoldering iron to warm up, first of all, don't work with electronics on your bed. I know I've said this repeatedly, but I'm going to move this thing over to my desk for the actual soldering and subsequent testing operations. It wasn't a good idea to have it here anyway, so please don't do like I do and then start a fire in your bed and burn your house down. That just will not do. Second of all, make a note of where all the connectors go prior to removing them. Now in this case, Sherwood was kind to us and actually labeled the board with the locations of all these plugs. So if you could trace the wiring, you would know two transformer, two power switch, etc, etc, etc. But don't always count on device manufacturers being that kind, because in this case all of these connectors could be plugged in interchangeably and some of them being plugged in in the wrong place would no doubt cause disaster to strike. A little bit on the theory I'm working with here as well. My theory is that every now and again that voltage regulator comes up just far enough to satisfy the microcontroller and let the set start. But it won't usually do it because the set almost always starts up and then falls back down again and shuts off with a blinking power light. So that's what I think is going on here. I think that positive 12 volt feed to the amplifier board is not being generated correctly by this voltage regulator because it has failed or it is being loaded down. So I'm going to remove it from the board and I'm going to try and see by carefully examining the traces on the board and performing meter checks if there is indeed some kind of a short in the board or on a component. Now with the board out of the unit and removed to my little work desk here which needs to be cleaned off a bit, it can be clearly seen that these voltage regulators have discolored the board from the amount of heat they produce so clearly they are being run pretty close to their limits even with the heat sinks on. 
So it's not totally unreasonable to think that there's something to the theory that one of the two has gone bad, and that perhaps the other one might merit re being replaced just because it looks like it's had a fair amount of stress too, even though it seems to be working at the moment. And there is the newly installed part, both top and bottom. So let's go ahead and throw this thing back together and see if it works somewhere more along the lines of the way it ought to. All right, our power on. Let's go to our 12 volt connector here. Going out to the amplifier and look at that. Things are looking much better than they were now. So let's go ahead and put the amplifier board back in this thing. See if it actually works the way it ought to. Now the amplifier board is held in on the sides by two screws. Two on each side. And then there are three screws here along the bottom that hold it in down there. So we'll go ahead and put those screws back in. And then I'll go ahead and install all the cable routing hardware, like this little uh, guide board that actually mounts to keep the power and headphone signal wires away from the amp board. And we'll do a DC offset test on this thing to make sure it's not putting nice warm speaker toasting DC on its outputs. And we'll go from there. All right, the set's turned on and we've gained an additional relay click that we did not have before from this little relay on the amplifier board whose function I am not entirely sure of because I didn't really pay much attention to tracing that part of the board. But let's go ahead and turn the volume all the way down. Make sure we'll put this thing on a quiet source that's not playing anything so as not to artificially skew our readings. And let's go ahead and turn all four of the speakers on. Go around back with our meter set to the DC volt scale and we'll do an offset test and just see how this thing is doing. And there's the results of our DC offset test. All of these are pretty much in close range with one another. Some of them are maybe a little bit on the high side, but they're close enough to being right that I'm not going to worry about it too much. So there you have it. Let's go ahead and hook up some speakers to this thing and see if I can listen to my nightly radio program. You might be thinking that you'd want to hook up headphones because that's more convenient, but I'll tell you right now, it is a wise man who said, do not test audio amplifiers with headphones because you could blow your ears right off of your head or introduce a lot of smoke into your brain, which would not do it any good. Bye.